orange. You can see it's bumper. Got a bird's eye view, and it certainly doesn't look good from up here. The tank is full. The engine's humming. Those wide open roads are beckoning. So sit back and get ready for motoring 89. Brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. This week on Motoring 89. There's a number of myths that have come about airbags. Oh, when this bag goes off, it's going to envelop me. It's going to pin me in the car. I won't be able to get off. I think uh, the big thing is seeing is believing. I'm sure most people who come here really don't know what to expect. I know I didn't. We are at the Toyota Motor Manufacturing Plant in Cambridge, Ontario. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 89. Now at first glance, this place looks like your average car assembly plant. But don't let looks fool you. There is nothing average about this place and we'll discover why later on. But first, we're going to talk about seat belts. Now it's no secret that every year, seat belts save thousands and thousands of lives. But if you're one of those stubborn people who still can't get used to those belts, our Sandra Neal now tells us that you ain't seen nothing yet. We all know that seatbelts are law in Canada, but in many of Ford Canada's 1990 models, there will be an additional safety device in the event of a collision. And to prove the point, they've brought in a heavyweight spokesperson. There you are. <laughs> They're called airbags, and in the event of a head-on collision, they take less than half a second to deploy. Transport Canada says that in combination with seat belts, airbags could prevent death or injury to nearly 240,000 Canadians. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very nice to be back in your country again. You're making me feel very at home with your weather. <laughs> um, with the help I of Jackie Stewart, said, the Ford the Motor Company Ford of Motor Canada Company will be introducing airbags in 80,000 1990 models. I've been now with Ford for almost 25 years, so most of my career has been spent with Ford Motor Company. It started off in motorsport, because suddenly I had a fairly serious accident that I, for the first time, found that I couldn't walk in water, that I was as vulnerable as an next person. You know, most people believe that it'll never happen to them. It happened to me, I suffered by it, and I suddenly realized there was a lot to be done. Now the airbag comes in, and that's what's called a passive system. Now, the airbag, when it's fitted, of course, you've still got to wear your seat belt, but nevertheless, it's going to reduce injuries, in my opinion. It, that's what it's proven in all of the tests. Jackie Stewart's opinion certainly carries a lot of clout, but critics are not convinced about airbags. They ask the questions, will they explode accidentally? And don't they block a driver's vision? Robert Rosenfeld spearheaded the development of airbags in Ford models, and he assures us there's nothing to be alarmed about. Uh, we just finished deploying this airbag on a, in, a, in, a, in a mock uh, simulation of how an airbag works. There's a number of myths that have come about airbags. Oh, when this bag goes off, it's going to envelop me, it's going to pin me in the car, I won't be able to get off, get out of the car. The bag is totally deflated one second after the crash, and I think you, you can see for yourself that it, it, it's just not possible to do it. It cannot block your vision. And we know of no case where the airbag is ever deployed when it wasn't supposed to. One incident where the airbag did deploy occurred across the border and saved the life of Melanie Stevenson. When it happened and when I when reality sets in, I think it takes a couple days when you go look at the car and you see really what happened. I, I realized at that point that if I hadn't had, you know, the airbag, and I also had my seatbelt on, that I probably would not have, you know, survived the accident. Surprisingly, the use of seatbelts is not law in all states. But by September, all 1990 cars in the U.S. must be equipped with airbags or automatic shoulder belts. In North America, at least in the United States, they've been very lazy about buckling up. For what reason, I do not know. They're overprotected in so many other avenues of society, and yet they will not go to the trouble of wearing their seat belts. You in Canada have given an excellent example to the Americans on that. We have a very substantial leg up in marketing that product in Canada versus the US. Of course, in the U.S., most states are still getting around to deciding whether or not seatbelts are a good deal or not a good deal. So as a result, most Canadians are 
have a much higher propensity for things that improve their safety. So it ought to be a, an easier process in Canada than the U.S. Do you think we're going to be seeing airbags as standard pieces of equipment in all vehicles in the years to come? Long term, not tomorrow and not next year, but we'll start at the top. We've got to start somewhere. And I think you'll even see them in trucks one day, but uh, that'll be down the road a little piece. I think if I look back in 30 years' time or whenever, I would like to be looked upon as someone who had contributed much in the area of racing safety. I think I would prefer even that people see me in that light rather than the three world championships or the 27 out of the 99 Grand Prix that I won. Um, because I hope that I've saved life. I hope that I've attracted more people's attention to the need for safety, more awareness to it. So I would say that's the thing I'm most proud of. I'm Stephanie Page running for Pet of the Year for 1990 and Motoring will be right back. When Motoring 89 returns, Graham has his favorites for 89. There's a rough road ahead with no end in sight. Quaker State engines don't know when to quit. Quaker State is the only motor oil with QSX, quality engineered to exceed every single car maker's Canadian requirements for maximum engine protection. So pistons are protected from friction mile after mile. Valves are protected from wear year in, year out. That's why Quaker State engines run strong and run long. Quaker State engines don't know when to quit. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. Over the last number of weeks, we've looked at a total of 12 different cars. Now this week on Test Drive, I'm going to take those 12 cars and try and put them into some sort of perspective. As I did last year, I formed four different categories. First up is the multi-purpose vehicles. Then we've got sports cars, family cars, and last but not least, the luxury cars. In the multi-purpose class, we tested the Mazda MPV and the Toyota Extra Cab 4x4. For me, the MPV represents the best multi-purpose, multi-passenger vehicle available at the moment. I say at the moment because upcoming are a new Nissan and of course the new Lumina APV which is set to debut later this year. My hunch is though that the MPV will reign supreme for some time yet. Many of the design criteria for a pickup truck are predetermined because of its intended use. Toyota's latest generation truck with its rounded lines, tall stance and plenty of glass is a fairly attractive package. With the ever increasing popularity of pickups, we could not pass up the opportunity to put Toyota's latest generation pickup to the test. Off-road, the extra cab was very nimble and the V6 tamed the elements with ease. On the highway, again, the V6 engine and a very comfortable interior helped the miles melt away. The only chink in the armor was a very stiff suspension which on washboard type pavement made the ride very uncomfortable to say the least. After a week with this truck though, I began to understand the attraction. We kicked off Motoring 89 with the latest generation Nissan to bear the 240 nameplate. The original 240 defined the two-door sports car. With the new 240SX, my feeling is that this latest rendition will continue to define the term and remain the benchmark by which other sports coupes are judged. Right, brace yourselves. Holy mackerel, that is amazing! Before the Taurus SHO, front-wheel drive sports cars were either mundane or plain scary because of the amount of torque steer enter the SHO with a full 30 horsepower more than the competition. All in a neat, understated package that exhibited very little of said dreaded torque steer. In short, Ford created a demon that is totally manageable. And so the next time you're driving your expensive European sedan and a Taurus starts breathing down your tailpipe, move over and save yourself a humiliating lesson. The third sports car we tested was the Dodge 2000 GTX. In every respect, this is the consummate family sedan, capable of putting a little zest into the owner's life. The superior suspension, peppy engine and attractive appearance will give the competition a good run for their money. 
Selecting a winner in this category was extremely difficult because I like the understated approach of the show. I like the handling and refinement of the 240SX, but it was the Dodge 2000 GTX that caught my imagination and so wins my vote. In the family class, we tested four totally new cars. First up was the Buick Century. It featured new looks, Dynaride suspension, and a new, more powerful 3.3-liter V6 engine. All in all, a neat package that was both comfortable and classy. Next, we looked at the Hyundai Sonata. The car held some surprises. The engine, usually one of Hyundai's weak points, proved to be both smooth and refined, and the high torque output made the engine seem more powerful than it actually was. The interior was much larger than I expected, and the sticker price much smaller. The third car we looked at was the much-heralded Chevrolet Lumina. This is the first of the four-door GM10 models. In somewhat of a departure from the usual Chevrolet philosophy, the Lumina came with a heap of standard equipment, most noticeable of which was its new 3.1-liter V6 engine. However, in a peculiar twist, the Lumina was almost $1,000 more expensive than the Buick Century, and yet had a smaller engine, a sparse dash, and generally a dowdy interior, making the Century seem like a steal in comparison. The fourth and final car in this class was the Plymouth Acclaim. Although the Acclaim owes its base platform to the K car, it is a much improved version that bears little or no resemblance. Our test vehicle was equipped with Chrysler's new 2.5 litre turbocharged engine. Again, the car was nicely packaged and with minor refinements could be a good buy. All four of these cars should generate a great deal of interest for their respective manufacturers. My choice here goes to the Buick Century because it offered a great deal at a reasonable price. The final category comprises of the luxury cars tested. First up we had the Ford Thunderbird. In base form this car is just plain uninspired. Subsequently though I had the opportunity to test the Super Coupe. Now this is a real car. The performance is in keeping with the style and panache the car exudes. Up next was the Toyota Cressida. This latest rendition has what previous models lacked, and that put quite simply is oomph. Last but not least, we tested the Audi 200. This is the replacement for the much maligned 5000 series. I felt for a car that nears 50,000, the poor initial acceleration and the uninspired body revamp don't do the car or company justice. When the V8 version is available, I think the overall driving pleasure will be increased substantially. Of the three cars tested, the Cressida represents by far and away the best buy. However, the luxury car segment is growing very rapidly and Toyota has its work cut out to maintain the lead. Well, that concludes Test Drive for Motoring 89. Looking ahead to Motoring 90, we've already secured a Miata and that's bound to cause a stir on the streets. We've secured the 300ZX, a real hot number from Nissan, and of course Chevrolet's new people hauler, the Lumina APV. Until September, I'm Graham Fletcher for Motor in 89. Next on Motoring 89, rest for tired tires. Hello, I'm Jackie Stewart. It's a great day for Motoring 89 and for motor racing too. You're looking at a Toyota going through the leak-proof test. High pressure water is applied to the car for just over a minute. The car then leaves the compartment, is dried off, and checked for leaks. Now, one car a day is taken off that line and given the real water test. It's called the drizzle test. And the car sits under this drizzle for over seven hours. And they tell me that in the month of June and July in Japan, they get very drizzly weather. So we have the drizzle test, and it is unique in North America. All right, we're going to join a guy who certainly isn't all wet, our favorite mechanic, Bill Gardner. How can you tell if and when your car is a candidate for a wheel alignment? Well, there's quite often a lot of feedback that you get through the steering wheel that'll give you a good indication of whether or not your car needs a wheel alignment. For example, if you're constantly winding the wheel tighter and tighter to the left or to the right to keep the car going straight, you've got a pull that's likely caused by either a bad tire or misalignment. That's definitely something you need to correct. If you've got a shaking condition, that could be an imbalanced wheel tire assembly or a tire or wheel that has a lot of run out. If you're having to fight the steering or constantly counter steer in a crosswind, 
where the car requires a great deal of steering to keep it straight, that's an indication that your alignment's out as well. It makes the car more difficult to drive. When the, car, when the car's wheels are aligned perfectly, you'll have least rolling resistance, best fuel mileage, and easy steering, and maximum tire life. Now before you dive into doing a wheel alignment on your car, it's important to check all the tires. First of all, of course, the pressure should be checked. That pull that you're feeling in the car could be as simple as one soft tire, so check them all. Also have a look at the tread of the tire. You'll have, you can see that this one's nice and evenly worn. This tire has a lot of miles, but it's very, very evenly worn left to right and fore to aft. There's no cupping or sharp leading edges or trailing edges on this tread. This tire's in good shape. Now, if, if you feel a rough edge here, a definite leading trailing edge type of wear, or you see one side of the tire worn off, or a cupped, you know, a wavy, bumpy type of tread wear, that's an indication that you've got an alignment problem, and it may require replacing that tire and correcting the alignment problem that caused that abnormal wear. This particular car tire has an awful lot of miles, but it's quite evenly worn. You can tell that this car is pretty well right on in alignment because of the tire wear is just nice and even and smooth. Traditionally, we have three adjustable angles in the front end, and we've brought this extra tire and wheel in to help show those. We have caster, camber, and toe. Caster, if we can imagine a, a line drawn through the ball joints of the car, with that line tilted back at the rear, that would be positive caster. If that, if that angle was tilted forward, that would be negative caster. Camber, the inward or outward tilt of the wheel at the top, that would be negative camber. There's the front of the car. And positive camber and zero. We want to keep it as close to zero as possible for even tire wear. And of course, toe, which is the most important angle for tire wear. Tires slightly towed in or together at the front or straight ahead or slightly towed out. Front wheel drive cars, usually slightly towed out. Rear wheel drive cars, as a rule, slightly towed in. Now, before any wheel alignment can be performed on a car, we must check all suspension and steering joints to make sure that they're not bent broken, damaged, or worn out, and repair as necessary. And that term, front wheel alignment, is almost a dead issue. Many of today's cars require total four-wheel alignment for cor correct, precise steering and proper tire wear. Many of today's cars, however, don't have provision for critical adjustments that have to be made. In this case, you'll have to talk to your alignment man and ask him if he's aware of many of the specialty components available in the aftermarket today to correct some of these alignment problems on today's vehicles. I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 89. Still ahead on Motoring 89, a Toyota team effort. For a limited time, the Nissan Sentra comes with a four-speaker stereo cassette system, 8.9% financing, and air conditioning at no extra charge. Save $1,600 in options and get 8.9% financing on a Nissan Sentra. For $11,899, you can get a hard body king cab with all these options at no extra charge. And we'll throw in this attractive carrying case for nothing. Save $900 and get 8.9% financing on a Nissan hard body. There's a rough road ahead with no end in sight. Quaker State engines don't know when to quit. Quaker State is the only motor oil with QSX, quality engineered to exceed every single carmaker's Canadian requirements for maximum engine protection. So pistons are protected from friction mile after mile. Valves are protected from wear year in, year out. That's why Quaker State engines run strong and run long. Quaker State engines don't know when to quit. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. We're back at the Toyota Motor Manufacturing Plant in Cambridge, Ontario, and with me right now is the Vice President, Bill Easdale. And Bill, first of all, thank you for allowing us to come in this gorgeous plant. This is not only Canada's newest plant, but what, from what they tell me, this also has a brand new philosophy on exactly what car manufacturing uh, corporations and, and manufacturing plants should be all about. Yes, we, we brought the philosophy back from Japan with us uh, with a tremendous uh, teamwork concept uh, we decided not only was it going to be a unique auto plant, but it was going to be a unique Canadian plant. The emphasis on quality is, uh, is outstanding. Uh, we don't only have people working on the line. They're not only people that work building cars. They're all quality control technicians, each and every one of them. 
we're uh, producing uh, approximately 100 cars a day on a one-shift operation. When we move to two shifts uh, late this year, we'll, we'll have a capacity of about 50,000 cars per year. Bill, you're the vice president. Now, most vice presidents are usually wearing a three-piece suit. You're not. Tell me about that. Well, uh, Brad, the, uh, the, the corporation, the, the group, uh, the employees, uh, the team members in this organization decided we wanted to wear uniforms. And uh, generally what we do, we do top to bottom. Uh, we've eliminated uh, executive parking, executive dining privileges, uh, executive offices. We have the wide open office concept and the uniforms are all part of it. It's, it's a great leveler. It makes everybody feel at home. Uh, you know, there, are, there are no distinctions or class distinctions between people and all the management dresses the same as all the workers and uh, I guess somebody from the outside can't tell a difference. A couple days ago I was in downtown Toronto on a business matter and I had rushed out of here and I was wearing this uniform and I went into a, a large consulting firm and the uh, lady at the counter wasn't sure whether to let me in or tell me to wash the floors. She said I looked like a janitor. <laughs> so I guess it has its positives and its negatives, but it's great. Very few of the plant workers have had previous experience in the automotive world. One exception is quality control manager Don McFalls, who spent 21 years with the Ford Motor Company in Oakville, Ontario. Well, I think it's a totally new environment because everybody has a part to play here. Everybody feels that they're contributing. It's not like a worker coming to work and only being a number or only being a, a part of the machinery. Each person here feels like they can contribute by their input, both by physical work and by their mentality, offering suggestions, uh, making changes, physically making changes to their own workplace. I think they have a sense of belonging here. I guess I have to say that working here is the most positive work experience I've ever had. Uh, when they say team, they mean team, and uh, that makes a difference. Everybody pulls together, everybody works together. Um, even the tough times aren't so bad when you've got a lot of support. Um, as far as working here, I've learned everything I never thought I would learn, and most of the things I thought I knew before I don't need anymore. Every day is a learning experience for the employees and the teachers are from Japan with at least 30 Japanese families permanently settled in Canada. Uh, I found uh, one of the biggest changes for me was to really appreciate what a truly nice bunch of people the Japanese people were. My first assignment was to go to Japan for a month and I've never knew a, a more friendly, easier to, or more caring bunch of people and it's just carried over here. Mark and I have developed a real good friendship, both outside of work, our families meet together, and uh, I think people are people no matter where you come from, and then uh, getting to know each other and getting to uh, respect each other, very easy to work with. Were you nervous? Were you a little nervous coming to a new country, a new people, and a, and a brand new startup for this factory? Yeah, first of all, the, uh, we have uh, a completely different culture, so uh, how do I uh, adjust it here, and uh, how do I have, uh, what food or uh, what lifestyle that is a very uh, cause of nervous you know the Japanese flavor can be found everywhere here at Toyota including in the cafeteria each day you have a choice from a North American or Japanese menu for instance the soup today cream of mushroom or miso and you can even add some tofu for flavoring and what's lunch without chopsticks and Japanese tea the Cambridge plant opened in November of last year, so it's still a new experience for everybody. And the cynics just might suggest the team spirit is simply a novelty that will soon wear thin. I don't think this novelty is going to wear off because it's not just a fantasy. It's based on real, um, real work people do, and they do it with each other. And it's not something that you can just forget about because you're reminded every day of what's really important and how much you really work with other people. That's what the novelty was, was the working together. And that doesn't change. If that was to stop, then we just couldn't function. You tell me this is not your average coffee break. Tell me why. No, this is not an average coffee break. We'd uh, like to take this opportunity to make a very special announcement for our team here. Uh, effective uh, June the 23rd, uh, but being announced today, uh, Bud Barnett, our team leader in assembly inspection, is being promoted to group leader for assembly inspection and receiving inspection for our second shift. A few words, Bud. I think uh, the big thing is seeing is believing. 
I'm sure most people who come here really don't know what to expect. I know I didn't. And to see people really working together with a common goal, it's something you read about and you talk about, you talk about integrity, you talk about loyalty and trust. Here it happens day in and day out, and it's just part of our business. Well, as you can hear, the shift is coming to an end here at the Toyota Motor Manufacturing Plant in Cambridge, Ontario, and so is this show. But before we go, we want to thank everybody here at Toyota for allowing us to bring you inside and give you a peek at Canada's newest automobile manufacturing plant. Now, up over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking back at the best of on Motoring 89. But then in September, we'll start looking ahead to the 1990s. Make sure you join us. We'll see you then. Motoring 89 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will.